Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today, we're talking about the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. <laughs> Finally. You know, we're on like episode 110 of this kid's science show. When are we going to talk about what killed the dinosaurs? <laughs> the time has come. We're going to rewind the tape of the fateful impact back to the moment that the asteroid set out on a collision course with our planet. Over the years, we've gotten many questions from listeners about what killed the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs dominated the Earth for 160 million years. Then, all of a sudden, they disappeared. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, it was one of the biggest mysteries in all of science. Like, people talked about it all the time. Yeah, well, since dinosaur fossils were discovered, scientists have been asking why dinosaurs are no longer with us. They came up with all sorts of ideas for decades. But one theory rose above the others. That an asteroid killed the dinosaurs, leaving a massive impact crater called Chicxulub off the coast of Mexico. And that's what our listener Lucian asked us about. Where did the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs come from? I think scientists can figure it out by looking at the crater. So where did the asteroid come from? Like, I assume outer space, like certainly not on our planet. <laughs> Someone didn't throw it up and then have it land back down. <laughs> <laughs> I think Lucian knows that it came from space, but that's what makes this question so interesting. Can scientists know where the asteroid came from? Let's ask our listeners. Where do you think the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs came from, and how would scientists find out? Think about it. We'll be right back with the story, and then the science behind the asteroid's impact. Okay, we're going to start off our answer a little bit differently than usual, with a movie. What? We're, we're making a... Wait, I, I definitely don't have my hair and makeup ready. <laughs> um, we need it's to a, pause. It's a podcast movie. No makeup necessary. We're going to watch the journey of the asteroid from start to its dramatic finish when 75% of life on the planet goes extinct. Whoa, whoa, spoiler alert. Come on. <laughs> we haven't even started the movie yet. <laughs> Let's begin a long, long time ago in an asteroid belt far, far away. There are two gigantic asteroids moving through the outer parts of the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. They're leftover debris from building our solar system. And one day, they collide. The force of their collision breaks both asteroids into thousands of pieces. And these pieces find their way out of the asteroid belts, some of them careening towards Earth. But Earth is very far away from the asteroid belts. Their journey takes tens of millions to maybe a hundred million years. When they finally reach Earth's orbit, some of them pass by or hit the moon. But one, measuring about six to seven miles wide, collides directly with Earth at 27,000 miles or 43,000 kilometers per hour. The asteroid hits the Gulf of Mexico at the most destructive possible angle, punching a giant hole in the Earth 90 miles wide. After that moment of impact, everything happens at once, changing Earth forever. The rocks in the hole move like liquid in a bowl, sloshing back and forth before coming to rest as a ring of mountains. The impact sets off a tsunami, starts wildfires, and vaporizes rock into gases that cloud the sky. These gas clouds transform the atmosphere, blocking out light from the sun. The temperature drops and Earth gets cold. Without light, all the plants die out the food chain collapses. Ultimately, 75% of life goes extinct. A few things survive, including the avian dinosaurs that we now know as birds, crocodiles, frogs, and more. And importantly, small, rodent-like mammals survive. 
our ancient ancestors who had evolved to replace the dinosaurs as the dominant creatures on Earth. Oh, is that all a true story, or did you just make it up? <laughs> I didn't make it up. There is science behind every single part. For decades, scientists have been tracking down evidence from Earth and space to reconstruct that fateful moment from 66 million years ago. Sean Gulick is one of them. When I was a kid, I was fascinated by the dinosaurs. I totally wanted to be a paleontologist back then. So... I feel like that's like the story for 99% of three-year-olds. Is he the 1%? <laughs> Did he grow up to become one? No, he's not a paleontologist. He studies the rocks themselves, which actually tell us more about dinosaurs' fate than fossils. The fossils were just the very first clue that something had gone very, very wrong. So we knew that there was an extinction event because you knew that there was all these fossils that disappeared at the same time around the world. So wait, someone came and stole all the dinosaur fossils at the same time? <laughs> that is a huge heist. No, he means they disappeared in the rock record, which is essentially the history of Earth. You can't find fossils from the dinosaur's time past a certain age of rock. It's like someone drew a line in time that the dinosaurs could not cross. And a few geologists found this line in the rocks themselves. And they discovered in two different places, and in Spain and in Italy specifically, that there was this boundary layer, this centimeter of material, right at the moment that we have the extinction event. That boundary layer between the dinosaurs in the next wave of evolution contained a strange metal called iridium. Which is not present at very high levels on Earth's surface normally, but is in the asteroids. Wow, so like they found a space alien. <laughs> a space alien metal. This layer of iridium was actually all over the planet, like a fine layer of dust. So they made the argument it had to have come from outer space, basically. Okay, so it's basically they found a layer of space dust in the rocks that were created around the time that the dinosaurs went extinct. And that's the evidence of the asteroid. Exactly right. But there were a lot of different theories about what killed the dinosaurs. And the asteroid theory needed more evidence to prove itself. So then the next big question is, where was the crater? Yeah, that does seem like an obvious next question. Like, if there's a giant space rock that's depositing dust all over the planet, it would definitely leave a mark. <laughs> Scientists searched the entire planet using different types of images to reveal what was beneath today's rocks. Finally, they found a giant sunken circle off the coast of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. They went there to try and answer these questions. What does this crater look like? What is the processes that made the crater? And why would an impact in the Yucatan Peninsula cause the extinction of the dinosaurs and 75% of life on Earth? In other words, did this impact crater have what it takes to cause a mass extinction? To find out, scientists had to put together the story of the asteroid and measure the effect it would have had on Earth. And the effects are now really pretty clear. With so much evidence and details uncovered, scientists determined that yes, the effect of an asteroid hitting Earth in that space was enough to kill the dinosaurs. Like it really was that bad. It was awful. <laughs> but <laughs> scientific theories are always being challenged. And you want to get your evidence as solid as possible. That's why Sean went to the crater to drill for the final pieces of evidence, to prove the theory beyond a shadow of a doubt. And he had a really cool boat to do it with. So we brought out this flat bottom boat that has sort of legs, and it put the legs onto the seafloor and lifted itself up out of the water. So we were about 50 feet up in the air. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a really hard time picturing this. He's on a boat with legs that's lifting him up 50 feet in the air? Yeah, I kind of imagine it like a spider boat. <laughs> <laughs> but it's essentially like a portable drilling platform. And then we had a mining drilling rig, the kind that you might use on land, on the bow of, of, of this lift boat, which is called the lift boat Myrtle. Oh, Myrtle, that's an adorable name. <laughs> Myrtle was seriously equipped to drill into ocean rock 
and pull up long cylinders of sediments called cores. Oh, we talked about cores in our episode, The Expedition of the Science Ship, and I even follow them on Instagram now. (laughs) And I see all their cores. (laughs) There's lots of cores. This is the same thing, but different boat. And so Sean and Myrtle the lift boat are drilling into the ring of mountains that was instantly formed by the asteroid impact. It was unbelievably exciting as new cores were coming up from parts of the crater that nobody had ever seen before. Every time a core comes up on deck, it's an opportunity for a big discovery. You cannot always tell what you have from the cores immediately, but sometimes you can. One of those times, Sean knew that they had found the tsunami, that giant wave triggered by the impact, because the core had a layer of sand. What would possibly be big enough to put sand up on top of this ring of mountains? We realized it had to be a tsunami of incredible height that, you know, we could look at it and go, wow, I mean, I don't know what else could do that except a tsunami. That's unbelievable. So you can actually see in the rock something that happened in like one second, like millions of years ago. Yep, within the first day. Whoa. But what Sean couldn't see in the cores was the most important piece of evidence. We couldn't tell you that there was an iridium layer in the crater until a whole lot of laboratory work happened. So the iridium, which is the metal that comes from the space rocks, the space metal. (laughs) Yes, which should be a genre of music, I think. (laughs) I think it is. (laughs) (laughs) People had found iridium all over the world, but it hadn't yet been found in the crater itself. And that's what Sean and his team found. If you really wanted a proof positive that it's exactly at the right time, you couldn't have asked for a better one than finding that the global layer that defines 66 million years ago, this iridium layer, in the crater itself to say, in fact, there's no question that these are of the same time. Wow, so this like final piece of evidence just completed the puzzle, and, and that's it. Well, it's like when you finished a thousand-piece puzzle and you're like putting the last one piece in. So satisfying. But we've still got further to go in the story, back to before the asteroid hit Earth. Yeah, how do you study that? Like, there's all these clues left in the rocks from when the asteroid hit Earth, but did they leave, like, any, um, I don't know, space footprints <laughs> as they went through space? Like, something where you could tell where it came from? <laughs> something you can put your magnifying glass to? <laughs> <laughs> this part of the story is much less certain than the parts that happened on Earth. And the evidence comes from a group of astronomers who study how asteroids move through the asteroid belt. Sean describes their research like this. Hit the balls on a a billiards table or a pool table and then have them go all over the place and then try to track where they all come from. Okay, so it's like trying to reconstruct how that little triangle of balls at the beginning of your pool game broke apart but in space, in millions of years ago, and with probably a much, much bigger pool cue. Sounds hard. (laughs) It is, but there's a few things we have to go on. We know what our asteroid is made out of, and not all asteroids are made up of the same materials. So astronomers can track it back to a group or population of asteroids that are still moving around in the asteroid belts. There's an understanding of the populations that are out there and therefore what it would take to have a really large one end up on an Earth-crossing orbit when it did. Still, scientists are far from consensus on where that dino-killing asteroid came from. The version I laid out is up for debate in terms of timing, but scientists are pretty sure it had to come from two big asteroids going boom at some point. You know, to have a collision that kicks something out that ends up in the inner solar system is not that unusual. But then have one that kicked out something big enough, you know, a 12-kilometer or 7-mile-wide asteroid that just happened to hit Earth, you know, the odds of that are really, really small. Okay, so, so the dinosaurs definitely had, like, the worst day ever on Earth. The worst for the dinosaurs, but we're here. And arguably, our planet fundamentally changed, evolution changed, and humans eventually grew out of that new phase of evolution, and that's a really key aspect. In other words, we might owe our own existence to that asteroid. It took out our competition and gave humans the space to evolve. Who knows what the planet would have looked like had Chicxulub never have happened? And would we be here to look at it? Wow. 
last minute perspective shift there. I had to blow your mind one last time. So what do you think the planet would look like if the asteroid didn't hit Earth 66 million years ago? Talk about it with your family and friends, or try writing a story about it. What kinds of new dinosaurs might have evolved? And do you think people would be around to see them? Share your speculative fiction story with us at tumblepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to read it. Thanks today to Dr. Sean Gulick, research professor at the Jackson School of Geosciences and co-director of the Center for Planetary Systems Habitability at the University of Texas in Austin. Thanks also to Lucian for his excellent question. If you want to learn more about the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, listen to our bonus interview episode with Sean. It's available to patrons who pledge just $1 or more a month at patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. We'll also have the studies where you can learn more about the science behind the effects of the asteroid impact and the debate around the asteroid's origins. Go to our blog at sciencepodcastforkids.com to check it out. Sarah Robertson Lentz designed the episode art and edited this episode. Eric Kuhn is our engineer and mixer. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this show. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all of the music. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more stories of science discovery. Tumble.